My parents uh, are tremendous role models for me. They uh, left Indonesia when Indonesia uh, gained its independence from the Netherlands and the first president, President Sukarno, became a communist-influenced uh, president. And my father, who was an educator in Indonesia, was being told what to teach. And he felt that that was a very dangerous president. And, and so he and my mom decided to leave Indonesia and flee Indonesia because they felt that it was not good for their children. And so um, they were allowed to leave at that time uh, with the condition that they leave everything behind. Whatever they had, they had to leave behind. And they li literally left Indonesia with a suitcase. And there were six boys. Uh, my mother was pregnant with the seventh child. And we, the intent was to go to the Netherlands and then catch a boat in the Netherlands to go to Suriname, which was another Dutch colony in South America. While, he was wait while we were waiting in the Netherlands, uh, my father was offered a teaching position in a Dutch school system, which he accepted. So we stayed in the Netherlands. Uh, we stayed there for about five and a half years, from uh, 1954 till the end of <clears throat> 1959. Uh, the influx of Indonesian political refugees to the Netherlands was so large because, again, the Indonesian people were familiar with the Netherlands because they were a Dutch colony, that Queen Juliana at that time asked President Eisenhower for special immigration quotas for Indonesian political refugees to come to the United States. Uh, that was granted, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be uh, sponsored by a, a church in Grand Rapids. Uh, to, and so that's how we ended up in Grand Rapids. So we went from Indonesia to the Netherlands to Grand Rapids. And an interesting story about that, it's kind of a funny story I'll share uh, with the audience, is that, that when we arrived in Grand Rapids, we were sponsored by Fuller Avenue Christian Reform Church, which the Christian Reform Church is a Dutch denomination. So we walked off the train, and we're greeted by the deacons of the church to set, help us uh, settle into our, into our home. And we were speaking Dutch to people who had Dutch names who couldn't speak Dutch. So that was really interesting, the kind of first cross-cultural experience in, in the United States. So um, I've lived here in Grand Rapids all my life. Since 1960, we arrived in January 9, 1960. We made the front page of the Grand Rapids Press of the first Chinese family arriving in Grand Rapids uh, under these uh, circumstances. And um, so I've basically grown here, grown up here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It was an interesting transition because my father, who was an educator, said, we arrived on a Friday and he said, we're going to school on Monday. Now, we weren't fluent in English or anything like that. But the good thing about arriving in Grand Rapids was the school we attended initially was a Christian school and it had many teachers who were of Dutch uh, background who could speak Dutch and there were even students who could still speak the Dutch language. So my transition into the American society was not as uh, difficult as some others that may have had because of language issues. Some people ask me, Bing, how did you get into the flower business? When we arrived in Grand Rapids, one of the deacons was Frank DeVos, who was the owner and founder of Eastern Floral. He was instrumental in getting my father his first job as a janitor at a local wholesale floral company. And my brothers and I worked our way through high school and college at that company. And then in um, 1974, um, I decided, you know, 72, I decided to go in business for myself. And, and, and a year later, I bought out the company that that I used to work for. And so, <clears throat> so at that point, I began, the, I began my professional career as a business owner, as an entrepreneur in the floral industry, first as a wholesaler and then later on as a retailer. Uh, as, we sh as I saw the shifts and changes within the floral industry, the broadening market of the floral growing industry from predominantly U.S. growers to all of a sudden now the, the um, floral farmer growing market is across the world. Kenya today is the third largest exporter of flowers. And, and so, you know, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, the Netherlands certainly has been a major exporter of flowers. So uh, that's how I started my floral career. And, and, and today we are the owners of Eastern Floral, which is a, uh, one of the largest uh, retail floral companies in West Michigan and probably in Michigan. And uh, uh, so we're pretty proud of our accomplishments. And, um, you know, but that career is now in the past and here I am with a new career. 
I always try to explain and to encourage our young people is to, to encourage them to be uh, willing to be vulnerable to other cultures and to other thinking. Because what has happened to me is that my international experiences and, 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 and different cultural experiences has allowed me to understand how to deal with a market that is also called, you know, very diverse culturally. For example, I, I know that one of the things that happened in, in our business, in our retail floral business, is that when, when, when we purchased Eastern Floral, the company that I own today, we made an intentional change of what kind of inventory we would have within our store. Um, I told my, buying, uh, my buyers, I said, look, you know, maybe you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, the predominant customer base for Eastern Floral were white Dutch Europeans. But that's not true anymore today. And I said, we have to understand that the demographics have changed. So we began to add um, angels and Santa Clauses who were black skinned or brown skinned, not just white skin with blue eyes or blonde hair. So, so understanding that and understanding the, the importance of knowing your customer base and, the, and, and their cultural values and, and things like that uh, was very instrumental <clears throat> in allowing us to be able to, be, to gain the success that we have. A, a, a very interesting story about that was we, um, some years ago, we had a family who were Native Americans come into one of our stores and and said, you know, our, our I think it was a father passed away and we would like to have you design the, the flowers and the floral tributes for his funeral. And they brought in things that are relevant to their culture. Um, and so luckily we have on our staff, which is one of my commitments, our staff is also diverse, we had on our staff a Native American designer who understood what they wanted. I mean, if we didn't have her, we would have been kind of in the dark trying to figure out what, what that meant. And, and because we were diverse in our staff, um, she was able to help this family and uh, the family appreciated the fact that the things that they brought that was meaningful to them and to their culture uh, was integrated into the floral tributes and the arrangements that we made for the funeral. So, so it's very important. So it kind of, you know, those, those cross-cultural experiences that I've had living in Indonesia, living in the Netherlands, coming to the United States, living in integrated neighborhoods, all those things are assets in my life. They're not liabilities, they're wonderful assets. And, and those are the things that I believe is what makes our nation very good and a great nation. I mean, United States, you know, um, I don't always believe in the melting pot theory, but I do believe in the salad bowl. I believe that each one of us brings values and, and, and experiences and knowledge that, that when we sit down and listen to each other and learn from each other, we all become enriched and, and we become better individuals to utilize and expand the skills that we you know, have already had. I have always been actively involved in Grand Rapids to, to, to advocate for this richness that we keep on shoving to the side. And, and, you know, and, and if I have, a, if I have a, a, uh, a reputation in Grand Rapids, it's, be, it's the reputation that I'm always you know, uh, encouraging businesses organizations, institutions to, to recognize the value of inclusion and diversity. To recognize the value that every one of us brings uh, from, our, our, from our own life experiences that will enhance our own quality of life. Um, so this position was, I, it was not even on my radar. Um, I received a phone call last year between Christmas and New Year's. And, and I thought it was a joke because, because um, why would Governor Snyder choose me? I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I knew him and, uh, from the campaign trail in 2010 because I was running for a state house seat and he was running for governor. And we kind of connected because we were both entrepreneurs. We were both business owners. We were probably the only ones running <laughs> uh, that were similar in, in background. And, uh, and we kept kind of kind of contact when he won and I didn't win. And I said, well, you know what, congratulations. And 
I'm so glad, you know, and all those kinds of things. And I met him a couple of times down the road. I, uh, he was kind enough to accept my invitation to be a keynote speaker at, at a, one of our uh, Asian gala events. But this position was never in my mind uh, until I received a phone call from his chief of staff and said, the governor would like to speak to you about this. And, you know, I'm not, who's going to say no to the governor, right? So I said, sure, I'll speak to him, right? And um, I met with him on January 9th. And now I will tell you uh, that I'm a person, I'm a Christian. And, and, and I don't believe anything happens by accident. And January 9th was the date that we arrived in Grand Rapids as immigrants in 1960. And I took that front page, the copy of that front page with me. And I said, Governor, I don't know what your plans are. I, I don't even know why you chose me, but I just want you to know that January 9th that we're meeting today, here is what happened on January 9th in 1960. And he just kind of said, wow, he says, we need, to, we, we, need, we need to use this story. So he used that article to announce my appointment in January 31 in Grand Rapids. So, so it wasn't planned. It wasn't, <clears throat> I never even knew about this office. All I knew was the governor's uh, office called and the chief of staff, Mr. Muchmore, said, Bing, the governor, you're his first choice. You need to come down and talk to him, and we hope you will. And I said, of course, I'll come down and talk to the governor. So I arrived in January 9, and um, we had this wonderful conversation. And he shared with me what he wanted to do. And he said, are you ready to come to work? And I said, you know, I, I, I would love to be, to, you know, to, to be doing this work on your behalf. And his, uh, his uh, chief of staff, Mr. Muchworth, says, well, can you start this afternoon? <laughs> I said, no, I still need to kind of, you know, inform my staff that I'm going to do this, but I'll be here tomorrow morning. So, <clears throat> so we began that process, and, and then Governor Snyder uh, uh, announced the office <clears throat> in, in his state of the state address on January 16th. And uh, I made the announcement of my appointment on January 31, and I officially started February 3. You know, when it came to launching our image into the world, WE was really the only choice for me and my company. Whether we were in need of a website, hosting service, commercial, or music video, it didn't matter. WE literally does it all. They even produce television shows. And best of all, they provide these exceptional services at unbelievable rates. And because they're skilled at so many things, there was really no need to go anywhere else. Get a website with hosting service for just $14.95 a month. Register a new domain for just $1.99 a year. Get 500 full-color business cards for just $29.99 or 1,000 full-color letterhead for just $149. Call now or log on to we-productions.com. <laughs> 